Um, you don't walk. I mean, that's nothing big, but I mean, they always play a home and home with Bemidji because it's like you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. He always plays tough because they're all like, I don't know who are the owners now. Yeah, yeah. 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 and then they're yeah. middle of the pack or something. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Hutchinson City Council meeting for Tuesday, January 10th, 2023. We'll call the meeting to order. Uh, approve any council agenda or any agenda additions or corrections. Mayor and Council, I've got two additions for you to consider. One is for the purchase of a, a truck, um, and the other is a gambling license request. And so I'd ask that you add that on the agenda as items 11.5 and 11.6. Make a motion to approve with those changes. Second. Motion by Chad, second by Dave to approve the agenda with additions. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Invocations. Hunters Ridge Community Church. Good evening. You could have had some sunshine today instead of so foggy. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help. <laughs> Check in with the big guys. There you go. There you go. There you go. Well, good evening to all of you, and thank you for allowing me to pray before the meeting uh, begins. Happy New Year to all of you. So, um, why don't we bow together in prayer as we as we begin? Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we uh, are thankful for this new year. Everything we see, everything we can't see, exists because of you. We're grateful for your compassion. We're grateful for your love. And my prayer is tonight that uh, for, for these, the city council members and all who are involved with the city, and I thank you for them, Father. I thank you for the work that they do, the time that they give in order to um, care for the needs of, of the city of Hutchinson. And Lord, I pray as, as uh, was prayed in the scripture that uh, our leaders may help us live a peaceful, quiet life. I pray for an environment uh, where we can live godly lives. And I just pray for their wisdom and uh, humility to lead our city. Forgive us, Lord, when uh, we act in selfish ways uh, instead of for the benefit of others. But I just thank you for them and all the time that they give to, to serve this city. Thank you for the beauty of this city. Thank you for the way it was decorated through Christmas, too. Boy, that was great. And uh, thank you, Lord, for the great job that you do. I want to pray, too, Lord, for others. I think of our police, our firefighters, the helping agencies, our first responders who care for the needs of this community, who uh, care for those who are hurting, who have to uh, perhaps deal with people that are very difficult to deal with. Um, we just thank you for the way they provide and protect. And so God, I ask now that uh, through the meeting tonight, uh, there would be honor and glory brought to you too. And so I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Recognition of gifts, donations, and community service to the sea. Does anybody on the council have anything? <coughs> Alrighty. 
we have a Shady Ridge Playground project and the donations. Lynn. Good evening, Mary and Council members. Um, tonight we are joined with some guests and I'll invite them up here um, shortly. Hutchinson Park Park and Community Education staff have been working closely with some community members here in Hutchinson um, for a project for Shady Ridge Park um, to raise some funds and then also to help with the park improvements for the playground in Shady Ridge Park. So I would introduce um, Tyrena Kallenberg and I invite her up to the the podium and she can introduce herself and her guests and she has a presentation prepared for you. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Tyrena Kallenberg. This is my daughter Diana. Can you say hi? <laughs> no. <laughs> Can you tell her that she's on TV? <laughs> I'm joined by um, my husband, my mother, and our neighbors, uh, the Lamakers, Steve, Ann, and Henry. Um, we've been engaged in a journey, if you will, for the last six months to try and raise some money. Um, so I put a little presentation together for the, um, what board was it? The um, so Terry and I atten or attended our uh, PRC, so Perks Park Community Education Advisory Board, a couple months ago and gave a presentation and she spearheaded quite the uh, fundraising effort. So I'll let her share um, how much she's fundraised and things like that. But she also has presented this at our, our advisory board as well. Yeah, this is just to give you some context about kind of what we're doing and why we're doing it. So I have our, our home. We moved into this home about a little over a year ago. Um, and I have the picture there, kind of the transformation. Our home had been a little bit neglected and um, we've, it's been a real labor of love trying to kind of bring it back to the, the glory that I think it deserves. Uh, <laughs> next slide. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Shady Ridge neighborhood is in the northwest corner of the city. It's kind of isolated up there. Um, next slide. Here we zoom in on it. The reason I show this is that our neighborhood itself is kind of bordered. We've got the country club to the north, the lake to the west, um, and then we've got some pretty busy roads, Highway 7 and School Road to the south and east. And while the city has done an amazing job with uh, bike lanes on the busy roads, which we appreciate, um, if you're going out for a walk and you live in this neighborhood, you're likely going to stay in this neighborhood just because crossing the busy roads can sometimes be more difficult. Okay, you look at me. <laughs> Next slide, please. So we zoom in even further up at the uh, north part there. This is where the park is. The reason I zoom in on this is because um, a lot of people, as I was fundraising, didn't even know there was a park there. They didn't know where it was. <laughs> and I like to highlight that um, as people are going for walks in this area, it's really very quiet. It's a beautiful place to walk, especially at sunset. Um, and there is a walking path that connects Shady Ridge Road to Connecticut Avenue. And so a lot of people, there's a lot of foot traffic in this area um, as people are going on walks and using the circle as a turnaround or the connection there. So this is what our park currently looks like. Um, I believe it was installed in 1993. Correct. Um, and hasn't had a ton of updating. So this summer, Diana, Kyle, and myself did go and um, wash it to make it a little bit cleaner, which did help quite a bit. Um, but there's still, the equipment is aging out and it could use some flavors of love to be a little bit more beautiful. So we undertook an initiative to start raising funds. Um, after talking with uh, Lynn and Sarah, we um, did a number of things. We started with a national night out down at the park and had the whole neighborhood attend to start getting people's attention to the issue. Started a GoFundMe, started a Facebook group, and then um, a door-to-door -door campaign to kind of understand the neighborhood, help raise awareness, and gain signatures of support. Our vision was really just to create a nature-inspired oasis um, that would invite people to stop on their walks and let their kiddos um, run around and play, and then you know go back on their walks. So it would be visited primarily by foot traffic. We did put together a tentative budget, um, and so because of the increases in inflation, uh, we are, <laughs> what I think was initially a one-phase approach is now a three-phase approach, and so we are at the finalization of phase one, um, which is a total of $28,138 uh, estimated. <coughs> Um, and so after tax plan, the city had budgeted $20,000, so we committed to raising $8,000 for the completion of phase run one. 
Um, and then we'll continue fundraising for phase two and three uh, to continue to achieve um, the size of the park that you know, we've envisioned. The city had identified Ginger Ridge Park on our CIP plan for 2026, but um, with having Tyrena approach us and say she wanted to um, raise some funds for the park, it was able to, we were able to bump it up into next year with the funds she had raised um, using our CIP funds of 20,000 and then the money she's raised. So it's now a 2023 project. So the results to date, so we have 125 signatures of support from 87 different homes in the neighborhood. Um, we have identified 45 children between the ages of zero and 12 that live within walking distance of the park. Uh, and along with 146 visiting grandchildren or visiting kids um, ages 0 to 12. Uh, we have so far raised $8,800, um, $2,650 from 25 different homes, $2,900 from 3Mers who utilize the 3M match program. Uh, so we were able to uh, double their donations essentially leading to $2,900. $1,000 from the IJ Birch Foundation, $250 from Citizens Bank, and then 3M Hutchinson donated $2,000. Um, so we really just want to take Shady Ridge Park, which I kind of view as the hidden gem of Hutchinson, and really just help make it shine. Thank you. Um, so this evening you do have a resolution to accept one of the, or one part of the grant donations of the 8,800. 8, um, last week, you, or two weeks ago, the last council meeting, um, you would have accepted the resolution for the $100 from the camera family. And then um, coming at the next council meeting will be the remainder of the funds. Um, we do have them in hand now, but the resolution will be presented next council meeting. So just want to say thank you to Tyrena and all the members of the Shady Ridge Park neighborhood. Um, their fundraising efforts have been um, highly regarded and we thank you for that because it just helps make our projects even better. And it's really nice when we can work with um, community groups and partners to help make these projects really come to life and they can then be a part of the process as well too. So thank you. It's individuals and groups that help Hutchinson out. Mm -hmm. it, it's a great, great thing. So uh, I applaud your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. It's a team sport. <laughs> Thank you. Know, you. I, you know, and just some history too for the council. We've got what, 41 parks in town. Mm -hmm. You know, we we did an inventory a couple of years ago on all the playgrounds. We realized we have over a million dollars worth of value in our playgrounds. Well. As you can guess, uh, prior to that, we hadn't had a CIP for replacement. Now we've got that in the works, and so there is a plan to upgrade and replace all our playgrounds over time. But you know, initiatives like this really help you know help us accomplish our goals of, of keeping those parks and upgrading those parks um, with time. So thank you for the, the residents. You know, it's, it reminds me a little bit of the dog park when we had somebody come and said, "Hey, we'd like to see a dog park in town." I think. The council said, hey, if you can raise some money, we'll we'll put some in and we'll build it. And that's that's what we did. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate it, too, from a staff perspective, because before um, you guys had reached out to us, utilization of the park we thought was going down. But as you've seen from her letters of support and the people that you've talked to, there's a lot of people utilizing and the families that are in the neighborhood. So we really appreciate um, being able to get something that will serve that community area as well, too. So thank you. Um, we got three resolutions, but can we do one? Yep, if that's your desire. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, we have resolution number 15554, resolution accepting $25 donation from Emily Sherman to the Hutchinson <laughs> Police Department. And resolution number 15555, resolution accepting $1,000 from the IJ Birch Family Foundation for the donation donation from the VFW post 906 for the VFW park improvements for upgraded playground equipment at Shady Ridge Park. And resolution number 15556, resolution accepting $2,000 donation from the village branch for the Fireman's Park project. I'll make a motion to accept all of these donations and approve all these resolutions. And just thank you to everybody that was involved in that Shady Ridge project. It's going to be great. So thank you. I'll second it. Motion by Chad, second by Tim to approve the donations and 
the three resolutions. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, public comment. Anybody want to address the council? Please come forward and state your name and address. All right, I did invite uh, Fire Chief Schumann and uh, John Webster from the utilities there. You know, that was one thing uh, I always say, uh, not the fire hydrant, and uh, Dave come up to me and said, why do you always mention that to adopt a fire hydrant. Uh, believe it or not, we have just a hair over 900 hydrants in this town. And I don't know if you listened to the news, but uh, they did have a, a fatal fire down the cities where uh, they had a hydrant that was buried. So um, I'll just turn it over to Mike and um, talk about the fire hydrants in the region. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, Mike Schumann, Fire Chief. Thanks for the invite. Uh, so just to, you're correct, we've got yeah, almost you know 150 some odd fire hydrants in the city. I think just from a, a clarification perspective, you know, I think there's some people assume that somebody else is cleaning or the city's cleaning them, and that's that's not the case. So if you have uh, for the residents out there, if you have a hydrant on your property or in your neighborhood, it's it's their responsibility to, to try to clear it. Um, and obviously with the snow conditions we've had, it's been uh, pretty <laughs> unheard of to have this amount of snow at this time of year. Um, and even just looking around the city from, from everything, as far as uh, the snow that's getting moved here over the course of the last couple of days to try to catch up, I'm sure it's gonna take another week to get fully cleaned out. But um, you know, each hydrant in the city protects a neighborhood so probably anywhere from six to twelve houses are protected by one fire hydrant so uh, we, we kind of talked about it at our training meeting the other night with the firefighters just to say you know look around your community and and look across the street because you never know I mean that hydrant might be on somebody's property that maybe they're not very um, mobile or able to get it cleaned out and somebody just needs to go take care of it so um, I guess that's my that's my ask is that uh, everybody kind of looks out and, and right now you can it's most there's some of them are completely buried and you can only see the the uh, fiberglass marker that's on them. So do they all have the fiberglass marker on them? Or? They do at some point until they get broke off. But yes, they they, they do. And if and that's another good point. If there is one that does not have the marker on it, or maybe it's been broke, um, that that contact the fire department and the street department and it'll get replaced. So it is important that those markers are on there. So they should all have that, yes. Sure. Uh, how big an area around, is it three feet each way, Mike? Uh, we try to tell people to, to clean a three foot path around it and then a, a, some type of a path to the street, a three foot path to, out to the curb so it's clear to get all the way to it without having to shovel anything, so. There was, Mike, I saw a comment on Life in Hutch, and uh, it's one of the reasons you kind of don't want to go on Facebook, but someone mentioned something about it, and the response from one of our residents was, why isn't the city clean that they plow it in? You know, it's like, come on. <laughs> you know, it's just that yeah, stupidity I, that... Uh, <laughs> I know, it's unfortunate. And, and again, it, it, part of it is just this crazy amount of snowfall. Yeah. I mean, and, and unfortunately, it gets pushed <laughs> where the hydrants are, so or to the curb edge, so it, it does make it a little problematic. But yeah, people need to understand that it's that it's the re, uh, uh, the residents that have it on their property that need to take care of it. So I've got one on the corner. I'm kind of proud that you could get your truck in there. <laughs> <I'm out> there. <laughs> you know, you kind of take care of it, take it as your own almost. I think everybody should do it if you've got one on your property. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All Any right. other questions? Or are you guys good? Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Have a good night. Uh, I did have John Webster from the Hutch Utilities. Uh, he's going to speak a little bit about uh, the gas meters. There's a vent on there that uh, mm -hmm. I know, and he did bring up a different point before the meeting here, and I'll let, let him talk about it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming, John. Mr. Mayor, thank you for inviting me, Honorable. Commission uh, Council members, thank you very much. Uh, I am John Webster. I'm the director of the Natural Gas Division at Hutchinson Utilities. I try to keep a low profile and let people know me. Uh, but I do thank you for, for letting me come up and talk. 
Uh, this time of year, as with everything else, the snow, the ice that's hanging off of the, the eaves uh, causes us problems. Uh, two, there's two major items that are a problem. The first I'll talk about are the regulators uh, getting froze up. The regulator is typically a, a round device. If you're looking at your meter, it's on the left-hand side. It's either on the left or above it. What the regulator, I, not to give you a big dissertation about natural gas, but the regulator reduces the pressure in the make from what's out in the street to what was into your house. So it's a very important device. The problem with it, with, especially with this snow, is there's a vent on that regulator. That has, the, vent, the regulator has to breathe for it to work. If the vent gets frozen up, whether ice fills it up or snow packs it up, if that vent gets frozen it can't work, one of two things will happen. One is the house won't have gas. If it freezes up and the regulator shut off, the house is going to get cold. There's, you will get no gas to the house bad, right? The second problem is if the regulator freezes up when it's open, then the regulator can't close when your furnace shuts off. So now you have more gas in your house than you want. Both of them are bad. I would rather have the cold house <laughs> than the overly hot house, if you, if you know what I'm saying. So we just ask residents that when they're around their meter set, cleaning it off, if they could just get the ice and snow away from the regulator. The meter can be covered. I'm not too concerned about the meter itself. It's the regulator that really causes a problem. The second big item, and if you drive around town, you'll see houses where a lot of icicles hanging on them. Especially, the, what probably causes us problems are the houses with the very short eaves. And our meter is underneath there. And you look up and you see this huge ice block that has the potential of falling on our meter facilities. Uh, about, I think it was about two years ago, uh, a Friday, I believe it was a Friday night late, it's always late when we have problems. <laughs> uh, a large block of ice fell off of a uh, trailer house in uh, one of the parks here in town and actually broke the meter set off underneath the valve. So there's no way to stop it off. Of course, we were calling, the fire department was responded, they were there, um, it was cold, <laughs> it was cold, um, and there was gas blowing. I mean, there was no real way to stop it off. Mm -hmm. So, with the help of the fire department, with, with my guys doing a wonderful job, they finally got the gas shut off, nobody was hurt, no fires, everything turned out fine. But we do ask residents to go out and look above your meter and if there's a lot of icicles, it's, it's tough because how do you clean them off, right? Uh, we're working with one of the trailer parks in town. They've been just fabulous with us. They are going to go out and actually themselves put a sheet of plywood up against the trailer over the ice and then clean the roof of the trailers off and knock all the ice off. Fantastic idea. We really appreciate that. That's the only real way to get those icicles. I mean, the little icicles aren't going to hurt a thing. It's the big chunks of ice that really scare us because it will take, it will destroy the meter, it will destroy the regulator, it'll break the piping right off your house, and then you have gas blowing, and the potential is there for bad things to happen. And your house is cold. And then your house is cold, <laughs> or it may be real warm, right. <laughs> and we don't and we don't want that. I mean, we want to. We want everybody to be safe. So we ask the residents if they can keep their regular, their meter set clean of ice and snow and try, attempt, if they have a lot of ice over their meter, attempt to clean it off in a safe manner. If they have questions, call me. I'm more than happy to come out and look or have my guys who are a lot smarter than me will come out and assist you or help you in some way to, to take care of a very dangerous problem. So just give a call at Hutch Utilities, ask for John Webster, and we'll help you out the best we can. Any questions at all? Uh, John, can you speak to the, uh, if, it, if the regulator is plugged or frozen, Yes. how should they go about I'm freezing that because I'm going to tell you a blowtorch isn't a great idea. Yeah, that's, I, I appreciate I'm gonna, I appreciate I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thanks for the safety. Uh, the the best 
the best thing to do is call us. We're on call 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I have guys that'll call, come at midnight or two o'clock in the morning, and hopefully they'll be very friendly and they'll take care of the problem. They'll just, they'll change it out is what they'll do. They'll put a new one in. So we don't, we don't, yeah, we don't want anybody to take a torch out there and, and <laughs> get well, it. moisture in them and that's the problem. Yeah, exactly, they'll get, there's moisture in the gas lines, unfortunately, and it gets up in there and it will, it will freeze. And if, it, if that's happened to your, your meter will freeze, call us. We'll be happy to come out day or night, Saturday, Sundays, no charge. We'll take care of the problem. Good to you. Thanks for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thanks for Thank you. <clears throat> we have the regular meeting minutes of December 27th, 2022, and the organizational meeting of January 3rd, 2023. I'll make a motion to approve them. Second. Motion by Chad, second by Pat to approve those two meetings, minutes. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. The full is carried. Uh, consent agenda will do by one motion unless somebody pulls something out for discussion. Uh, it is consideration for approval of authorization to approve the grant language and signed grant agreement between the City of Hutchinson and the DNR Conservation Partner Legacy Grant Program. B is on the on the eleven point five the truck. Hmm. Can we pull that off and talk about it? It's not in the consent agenda. Yeah. It's in a new business. Oh, I thought we had it. I'm sorry. If I'm being yeah. And B is claims of appropriation and contract payments. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Chad, second by Pat to approve the consent agenda. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Should I have number nine? Yeah. Uh, well, we have a public hearing at six, but uh, we'll skip down and do the Liquor Hutch year-end report. Good evening, Candace. Good evening, Mayor, Council. <clears throat> so a brief recap of 2022 at Liquor Hutch. This first slide shows you our sales since um, the remodel of the store in 2006. So for the past 17 years, you can see that we've had a nice trajectory of increase in sales. In 2022, our sales were $7,298,303, slightly below what our sales were in 2021 and below what our sales were in 2020, the beginning of the pandemic. 2020 and 2021, we saw record sales at Liquor Hatch. Also during that time period, Liquor Hatch has transferred to the city general fund $7,470,660. So significant transfers have been made. In 2022, we will transfer $550,000 to the City General Fund. A look at our sales between, comparisons between 2021 and 2022. We did see a bit of a um, adjustment kind of from the pandemic years in 2022. So our sales came in just slightly below 2021. Uh, 2021 was 7 million 339,403, and 2022, 7,298,303. One of the things that we experienced was a very, very slow first quarter in 2022. Um, actually had me a little scared about what was gonna happen. Um, we were 8.5% down in the first quarter of 2022. Uh, we had very poor weather. Um, 2021, we actually had some nice spring weather. In 2022, we had poor weather and that really negatively affects our beer sales in particular. Beer sales are half of our business. So when beer sales are down, <coughs> sales are down. 
Um, and also, there was a lot of economic uncertainty in that first quarter. Gas prices were rising. People were talking about possible depressions, and the, you know, so there was a lot of discussion, a lot of media about the uncertainty of the economy. So those first quarter sales were down like 22 percent. Second quarter sales were down just slightly. In third quarter sales, we were even with last year. Fortunately, the fourth quarter sales came on strong. So we ended up just slightly down from 2021. We had actually um, projected a slight increase, about a 2% increase in sales. And at the time of the projection, uh, Andy Reid and I were very uncertain how to project because obviously these pandemic sales were unusual. In 2019, um, well, between 2019 and 2022, <coughs> Our sales have increased 14.6%, which is been, we would never have predicted. So when we went to budget, it was very a very uncertain budgeting process. We decided on a 2% increase. We didn't see that. We really saw the adjustment on the pandemic numbers. Um, but I think we came in pretty well at 7.2 million, almost 7.3. You can see there the increases, the change by department. So our liquor sales actually went up 2.2%. Our beer sales went down 1.2%. That's mostly that first quarter when we didn't realize those beer sales that we normally had realized. Um, and again, half of our business, so that has a pretty dramatic effect. Our wine sales have gone down 6%. Um, the reason for that is it relates back to that 2.2% increase in liquor. We're seeing a dramatic shift in the last couple of years from wine into ready to drink cocktails and seltzers. So it's just kind of a generational nationwide shift. And we're definitely seeing that. Our customer counts were down 2.5%. Again, that it, we were down like 4% in that first quarter. And you really can't bring those customers back in, you know, unless you've lost them in the first quarter. Um, our average sale per customer, though, did go up 1.9%. An important thing to note is that even though in 2002 our sales were 1.7% less than we budgeted, our gross profits were actually managed to be 1.8% uh, above our budget. So we knew we were going to have increased labor expense, right? Because um, we increased our part-time uh, hourly wage, which was very necessary, very much appreciated. So we, think we knew that we had to very seriously work those gross profits so that we, in the end we can transfer that $550,000 to the city. So even though our sales are down, we did manage to increase our gross profits, which the gross profits in the end, those are the dollars that count. Um, some of the trends that we're seeing, as I mentioned, we're seeing people move from uh, that beer category into what is in our liquor category, ready to drink cocktails and seltzers. We're again, last year this really became a big issue and it continues. We're seeing more and more very low ABV or alcohol by volume products um, kind of being talked about as healthy alcohol products. Uh, beer, wine, and liquor. Uh, we have a whole section in the store now that is al alcohol removed products, and we're seeing increases there. We continue to have supplier out of stocks, price increases like you wouldn't believe. Um, a large part of what I'm doing every day is checking prices and making sure that we're uh, protecting that gross profit because our prices go up with every case that comes in. Um, discontinued items, labor shortages are affecting their shipments, their trucking, you know, so all of those things affect daily operations. And we're finding that we have some very effective tools, advertising tools in Facebook, Instagram, and our direct email uh, blast that we send out. So all of those things are working effectively for us. Some of the promotions that we have ongoing 
Our loyalty program has proved very successful. Um, to date, we have 11,358 members in our loyalty program. So these are individuals that are taking advantage of um, the point system that we have in place to realize some savings on their um, purchases. And one of the things to note with that program is the average sale for someone who is involved in the loyal loyalty program is $32.49. And the average sale for people that are not involved in that program is $26.64. So those people involved in the loyalty program on average are spending about $6 more per transaction, which um, in retailing, you know, we look for every extra penny that we can get as an add-on sale. So that's a very important important part of that loyalty program and it, it does demonstrate for us the effect that it's having, how well it's working. Our 15% off craft and import beer on Thursdays program works very well, generates a lot of traffic on Thursdays, um, gives the consumer a uh, special value and works well for us also. A couple of years ago at the beginning of the pandemic we moved into online purchasing and while we don't have the volume in that program that we hope to have at some point, it continues to increase on a daily basis. Uh, we saw a large increase in the last couple weeks of the holiday uh, because of weather. People didn't necessarily want to be out for a long amount of time, so they did an online purchase and just picked up their purchase. So we did see it work well during that time for sure. And um, social media features, as I mentioned, they're doing really well. And we do a lot of multiple buys in the store too, the, like three bottles of wine for $30, special value kind of thing. Those are working really well for us also. Some of our challenges and goals for 2023. Um, I'd like to mention that we had a retirement at Liquor Hutch first of the year. A 22-plus year employee, Virgin Schellenbarger, retired. And um, we very much have appreciated her efforts over all the years. She was an important part of our success, so we thanked her for that. Um, as a result, though, we had a new full-time hire. Um, one of our part-time employees and um, someone with a lot of retail experience, uh, Mr. Bruce Metzel, who is formerly at Cashwise, is now full-time at Liquor Hutch. Um, he brings a lot of really great experience. We're very happy to have him. Um, but there's a training process that will be part of the 2023 goals to get Bruce up to speed. Um, also, training overall is always a goal, and improving our training process is very important. Improving our product knowledge, <coughs> excuse me, among our employees is also very important. So we do a program that we call First Tuesday Trainings. The first Tuesday of every month, we bring our employees together and we bring in a vendor and <clears throat> they help us to train our employees on their products so that um, when the customer consumer comes through the door, we're able to best get them the product that serves their needs. So in 2023, we intend to focus those First Tuesday Trainings on the beer category. Um, as a result of the fact that the beer category has fallen off a little bit. And so we, and it is half of our business, as I said, um, it's important, especially in that craft and import area, that our employees understand the product and can sell it effectively. So that's one of our goals. Uh, for budget management, it's increasingly um, difficult to manage our labor to sales. Um, because of the increase in our part-time wages, which again, we appreciate because we've got really great, really wonderful part-time employees. We very much appreciate them. We want them to be well compensated and to be happy working with us. Um, but it does create an issue where we have to manage that labor so that we can come in around 11%, meaning our labor expense is about 11% of our sales. Um, so always a goal. And then again, to make sure that we're reviewing those gross profits, um, particular challenge as price increases on the cases that come through the door. So making sure that we get an appropriate gross profit. Inventory management, um, always 
always a goal at Liquor Hutch. So our wine inventory, because our wine sales are going down, we're putting some extra efforts this year into refining our selection and our inventory dollars. Um, we, we, we always want our inventory to reflect the percentage of sales that we're seeing from that category. So at this point with wine inventory or wine sales down, we need to very carefully manage that wine inventory. The liquor inventory though is increasing in sales. And so with that inventory, we, we're committing to making sure that we have unique products in the store. Um, one of the, our marketing philosophies at Liquor Hutch is service and selection. So we don't concentrate on having the lowest price in the land. You know, we concentrate on having the very best service. That's why we commit to all that staff training and also to having a wonderful selection. So especially in that liquor category, that's where we can concentrate on having some additional selection in 2023. And in the beer inventory, we really need to uh, refine the, the space to sales in our beer coolers. Uh, we refrigerate that project or product of there, so um, there's additional expense in that product. We always need to make sure that we've got the appropriate inventory in those coolers. And a big goal for 2023 is for us to improve our inventory cycle count procedures. So um, at Liquor Hutch and at most of the municipal liquor stores in the state at this point, um, we have computerized inventory systems. We don't shut our doors for the first couple days of January and count the whole store like we did 30 years ago. <laughs> we don't do that any longer. Um, we cycle count, which is a much more effective process. That means that we take a particular area of the store and every week we count a different area. Um, it helps us to make sure that our inventories are being maintained, that our receiving processes are in good shape. Um, <clears throat> in 2022, as an example, um, at the end of the year for the state audit or the city auditor, we do a or we can produce a report that shows every item that has been the inventory has been touched on throughout the year. So if we had to adjust an inventory up because there was some issue or inventory down because there was some issue, we can uh, produce a report that shows every change that has been made to our inventory throughout the year. And in 2022, the net effect of all those changes was about $980 on 7.3 million in sales. So that's basically the loss that we attribute to shoplifting, that kind of thing, because we're, we're taking care of our own errors. There's human error, no way around that. So we, we're adjusting for that throughout the year. We're adjusting for any breakage that occurs. Um, what is left in all of that change is generally something that has been, what has walked out the door. So less than $1,000 on 7.3 million in sales is a pretty incredible. Result. It's a pretty tight operation. Yeah. Pretty tight operation. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> Some facility improvements. In 2022, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm talking too much. <laughs> um, we did some exterior updates along with what was happening with the police our law enforcement center next to us. We wanted to be sure that we look good too. We don't want them to outshine us. <laughs> so we did some painting and we put up some new awnings. Um, we had some roof repairs completed. Our parking lot was updated of also along with that project. Um, I do want to make note though, we do need additional parking at Liquor Hutch. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to achieve that but if you tried to come to the store during the busy holiday season, it was not a great situation. Um, and then we also um, updated the domestic cooler refrigeration system in 2022. In 2023, some things that we're looking at, um, we don't really have, um, these things don't really fall into a capital improvement plan because they are not, uh, they don't meet the financial criteria. 
um, but these are things that we do within our budget. So we're going to uh, we're planning to refinish our floors. It has been that 17 years, and um, while we've done maintenance, they are now at a point where they need a kind of a complete overhaul. Um, our cash wraps also after that 17 years, the cabinets and the countertops are in bad shape. We need to do some work there. We have some lighting updates that we need to do throughout the store and our parking lot uh, landscaping update sent um, kind of along with the project that was done at the parking on the parking lot. <coughs> so that's a brief recap of 2022 and some goals for the next year. Any questions or anything I can? I think Candace, it, it uh, as you mentioned, the first quarter being soft and that was not just liquor hutch. No. I've been in this business myself for over 35 years, and, and first quarter statewide was soft. And like you said, it was weather, it was recession concerns, it was gas prices, it was food. And really, I mean, I think the rebound was, and I'm not just saying this because I'm in this business, but the rebound was good because there was a lot of unsurety there for a while, you know, just across the board. So, and the gross profit going up, I think, with the lesser count kind of leads to the job you're doing. Well, thank you. I, I think that the, the fourth quarter rebound, you know, is kind of a great thing for all of us. It, it really shows that there is more economic stability at this point. So we were very happy to see it. It's definitely been a challenge to do projections in retail across the board. And after if you can't base numbers off of pandemic numbers because that was a disaster. So right. um, good job on holding the ship together. You know, Thank it's you. just, it's been hard. Thanks, kids. So. Thank you. No, Candace. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do have a public hearing. Uh, we have resolution number 15557, resolution adopting a modification to the development program for the development of district number four and Modifying tax instrument financing district number four dash twenty three therein and adopting a mod modified tax increment financing plan therefore. Miles. Okay, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, good evening. Um, tonight we're going to discuss the establishment of a tax increment financing district to assist with the expansion of RD machine. So. Um, just a little bit about the company itself. This is a company that was founded in 1991 in rural New Ulm. It was just on a farm place. And then uh, uh, Jeff LeWay and Dave Mueller bought it in 1997. They brought the company to Hutchinson and they just had space inside of another company. And then after that, they had leased space from Dick McClure on Fifth Avenue Southeast. In 2006, they purchased their current building, uh, 15,000 square feet. Business is growing all the way throughout. In 2018, they approached the city and asked to lease 2,000 square feet at the Hutchinson Enterprise Center because they wanted to experiment with water jet cutting. And up to that point, they had always um, gone outside to get their water jet cutting needs met. And they thought, well, we can bring this part of our business internally, and then that'll also give us another skill set that we can market and expand, grow our company. So that was all kind of a big experiment, and, and that worked out really well. They got a lot of water jet cutting business, and that was one of the reasons that's leading to this current uh, need to expand, so continuing to grow. Uh, the company itself, it's, it's a CNC machine shop. CNC stands for Computer Numeric Control and they do machining and water jet cutting for products in the aerospace industry, energy, and medical fields. I know at the Enterprise Center, they're busy um, cutting components using a water, a water jet cutter to cut components for pipelines. Um, and then currently the company has 36 full-time employees and one, one part-time employee. So uh, they're at a point where they need to grow. They're just bursting at the seams and uh, they need to expand their footprint. Uh, they did a lot of research and looked at a bunch of different options and decided, okay, the, probably the best way to go is just to expand on their current site. 
So what they're planning is a 21,000 square foot expansion. Uh, so this would be 16,000 square feet of production space. That's the, let's see if we can show it here. And that long, narrow piece. And then there'll be 5,000 square feet of offices that'll get put on on the north side. And then the existing building is gonna be retrofitted with a new roof, siding, windows, doors, so that it all matches up real nice. So when it gets done, it, the whole thing will look like a new building. Um, All together, it's a $4.2 million project. Why is tax increment financing assistance needed? Well, as I mentioned, you know, they had looked at a whole bunch of different options. They thought about buying a building or building a new building, renovating the existing building, expanding the existing building. Ultimately, they decided just to expand in place. And as they were working through all the options, you know, they worked with a developer, or a builder, I should say, to develop a budget, and it was estimated $3.3 million to do this project. Citizens Bank was involved as the primary lender, and then as they went further into the project, they started doing soil borings and all that stuff, and then they discovered, you know, bad soils, and that just blew the budget right out of the water. And uh, I should note the bad soils, that's, kind of a common situation in the industrial park. Um, a number of years ago when we uh, redid Industrial Boulevard, that got to be a pretty expensive project because there was bad soils right in that area. And then also when we built the Enterprise Center, you know, the, the cost for the dirt work, it got high because we had to replace soils. And then uh, we most recently ran into this situation with Warrior Manufacturing when they did their expansion again, there was bad soil. So that's kind of a common uh, thing. There was bad there. soils at the new police facility as well, too. So, <laughs> so we're just have, used to bad facilities. Bad have, soils yes, you've buildings. heard of that before, right? <laughs> yeah, OK. There's bad soils at uh, the aquatic center, too. So I think in a, in a few places, we're we'll saying. So. A couple places around town. It's our little secret. <laughs> um, anyways, because of the bad soils, that blew the budget out of the water. You know, all of a sudden, the cost is $4.2 million. So then RD Machine said, well, we got to re-examine this project and cut where we can. So they, they did trimming on their project and scaled it back in some respects. Citizens Bank came forward and said, okay, we can put some more funding into this thing to help make it work. Um, Southwest Initiative Foundation came in as a second lender to help make the thing work. But then because they're going to be borrowing more, and they're going to have higher payments, that's where the TIF district becomes necessary because we've got to create a mechanism to help offset the higher debt service. So that's where the TIF comes in to help meet that gap and make the project work. And I'll talk a little bit more here on that as we go. So what we're proposing is uh, what's called an economic development TIF district. And I'll talk about how that works just for folks at home uh, that don't really look at this every day. How does tax increment financing work? Well, every company, uh, every private company, they pay their property taxes. And um, with RD Machine, you know, the, that existing building, it's got an estimated market value of a little bit more than 325,000. Their tax bill annually, uh, 10,836 approximately. Um, and then those taxes, of course, they get divided between the school district, between the county, and between the city. That's how we keep the lights on and keep providing services. So when a TIF district is established, that existing property tax payment, that gets locked into place. So city gets the same amount, school gets the same amount, county gets the same amount. But then this new development takes place the estimated market value of the property, it's going to go up, and then as a result, the property taxes go up, and then we capture that increase. The increase is what gets put back into the project to help offset the qualifying cost. So in this case, it goes back to help defray the cost for these additional soil corrections that are needed. So it's important to note that the original tax amounts, they continue going just the same way they always did, it's just the increase that goes back to uh, help the project. Um, and then when the TIF district ends, properties renovated or improved, we have new tax base, 
and then that new higher amount that gets divided between the city and the county and the school district. So then everybody wins. So Miles, how long is the tip? Is the proposed tip district? Um, this one's going to be a nine-year, nine-year tip district um, for the council and for the public. Once that nine years is up, that's when that that kicks in. That's when that's when we, we get the raise. And then it's also important to note that you know there's no tax dollars involved in this thing. I mean they're it's none of our dollars, it's company dollars that they're paying in as part of their higher property taxes. That's the part that gets captured and just put back into the project. So there's no out of pocket per se on the part of taxpayers. It's just the company that's paying it in and then a slice of that comes back to help offset their, their additional costs. Um, and then, so what we're talking about, and we have to talk about business subsidies too here. This is a requirement by the state law. So we're looking at a nine year economic development TIF district. Over the course of the nine years, then the total assistance that's gonna float back to the company would be approximately $637,000, a little bit more plus interest over year, over uh, nine years. So that works out to about 70,000, almost 71,000 per year that the company's gonna be paying in and then that'll come back to them to help offset these additional costs. So that's what the proposed assistance is. Public purpose of the, of the subsidy, it's one, to enhance the economic diversity of the city. Uh, secondly, it's to increase our tax base and then third, there'll be a job creation component as well. Uh, the measurable, specific, tangible goals, what the company's saying, uh, once the addition is complete, we're gonna commit to creating two additional jobs within two years. And I wanna just say that is a conservative number and we just wanna be real conservative because we can't find enough manufacturing employees as it is much less make commitments to bring in big numbers because they're hard to find. So we'll just be conservative. And then over time, obviously, the company's going to continue to grow. I mean, it went from two when they first came to Hutchinson to 36. So, I mean, that trend line will continue. So there's going to be more job creation. But for our purposes tonight, we're just going to say two within two years and keep it conservative. Um, financial obligation if the goals are not met. So if they don't create the, jo the jobs within two years, then they have to pay back the assistance. So there's, there's uh, repercussions if they don't create the jobs. And then statement of why the subsidy is needed. Basically, it's just needed to make the project work economically. Um, and the specific reason is just the cost of the soil corrections. I mean, they went from 3.3 million to 4.2 million. Overwhelmingly, that's the soils. So it just got to be quite a number. Um, and then the commitment to continue operations. They've been here for many years and they'll be here for many years to come, but we'll get a letter from them just to make a commitment to that effect. Uh, no parent corporation. And then there's no other assistance. It's really, it'd be Citizens Bank, a Southwest Initiative Foundation, and then if you guys approve it tonight, City of Hutchinson. So that would be about it. So um, this has been discussed pretty extensively at the Economic Development Authority. The EDA board passed a resolution yesterday recommending, yep, this makes sense, and we recommend that the city council um, give their blessing to this. And so tonight we're just asking for uh, approval of the resolution in your packet, and that's just to establish the TIF district and get the thing rolling. So I will be happy to answer, answer any questions. Uh, Mayor, Council, and the public, this is, I guess, the portion of this hearing where it would be the responsibility of the Council to open it up to the public for any comment. Um, and obviously that public comment would be towards the city issuing this potential TIF district to, to provide any feedback to the elected officials, obviously, who are responsible for whether or not they'd authorize or not authorize the TIF district. Any questions from the Council? Otherwise, well, I'll open it up for public comment. Another sellout crowd, I see. <laughs> Make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Motion by Chad, second by Pat to close the public hearing. And then other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, carried. I uh, have a motion for motion resolution. Resolution 15557. Five, five, I'll second. Motion by Chad. 
Chief. Motion by Pat, second by Chad to approve the resolution. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thanks, Miles. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, I'm finished with the second reading and adoption of ordinance number 22-836, uh, ordinance amending chapter 53 of the Hutchinson City Code. Uh, Mayor and Council, this is the second reading of this uh, ordinance and as you recall, this is related to um, our new rate structure that was implemented in 2023. Uh, a part of that rate structure is installation of uh, deduct water meter, uh, deduct meters for uh, irrigation or non-sewer water use. And so uh, if we look, and also the timing of when, how we uh, calculate the, the sewer charges. So in order to make this match the, uh, the uh, fee schedule that was approved, we needed to do some changing to this. Uh, again, this just would allow for uh, persons who choose to um, they can install a deduct meter and then we can reduce uh, the, their sewer charges by the amount of water that they use for non-sewer related uh, use, such as irrigation. Irrigation will probably be the primary um, non-sewer use that water would be used for, but it does allow um, significant industrial users and also commercial, industrial, institutional types of businesses to uh, um, also, uh, be able to have credit for non sewer use. So, any questions on it? There were no changes in the language from the last time we presented uh, a couple weeks ago. So, uh, be happy to answer any questions. Hey, John, and mainly a lot of times you're talking about people here getting their lawns and that they can deduct that from what goes into the sewer because it goes into the land so mainly correct so. correct yes and and um under the new fee schedule there they would have to install a meter um and then they would uh be charged for irrigation water at the highest residential rate and then there's an additional annual fee um, that they would have to pay so. ideally it, these would be extremely heavy users I mean, correct there would be some sort of investment and i, and yeah. I, I hope residents understand that because I think they see, well, if I got to pay, I'm just going to get an irrigation. Well, yeah. It sh you should be using some pretty significant water costs. Right, and correct. And, and there, there are, um, certainly they can contact us and figure out if it's, um, you know, if it's, it, it'll be a, if it'll pay for them to do that or not. Um, we do have some estimates out there what it would cost to, um, obviously we got to have, make sure that we can bypass the irrigation meter and get into the internal plumbing and different things like that. So there's some plumbing um, work that would need to, to, to go into that and, and also, uh, you know, to make sure that we can get at that and read it and install the readers and those kinds of things, so. Looks like you could be pretty busy calculating. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we, we, we have we have computers for that, and we also have Justin from the finance department. He's <laughs> <laughs> finance director, that's under his, yeah. uh, his job description. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's all I had, unless there's other any, questions. Anything else for John? I'll make a motion to approve it. Second. Motion by Chad, second by Pat to approve the ordinance. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, new business, uh, issuing taxi license to Benjamin Kranz of Kingdom Transport. Yeah, Mayor and Council, we do have a taxi service license request. <clears throat> um, they've met all the requirements um, with a clean background. So. I'll make a motion to approve it. Second. Motion by Chad, second by Dave to approve license. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. 
Uh, we have a purchase request, uh, 11.5 for a uh, pickup truck. You know, uh, John's here and we'll have him come up and do that. Yeah, what we're looking at is we have looked at, uh, it's primarily in the long run will be our crane truck for servicing our water, our wastewater lift stations. Um, uh, in that information, I included a page that looks like with a green on it. Um, that talks about the different um, lift stations that we have, the size of pumps, the distance to the pump. And so if we were to install a 4,000 foot crane on this, we'd be able to get to pretty much every lift station other than the hats and the EQ basin and the main lift station, which are gigantic pumps. And we would have to have specialty services come and help us with that in any case. Um, what we really see is, is that we have a significant amount of money that gets spent anywhere between uh, 6,500 up to $29,000 in uh, repairs over the last five years, averaging about 19,000 a year. Uh, and of those charges, trip charges and crane charges are make up the largest percent of the bill. So this will help us um, get that money back and utilize it. It also really enhances the operations for the operators in that they can do these uh, these uh, repairs when it's convenient for them uh, instead of being subject to a contractor schedule. Um, we do have a crane and we have used it for uh, certain things, but it's not heavy enough uh, and it doesn't extend far enough in, uh, to, uh, to service a lot of these. So, uh, so this is the cab chassis with a service body on it. Um, we've been looking around for these and uh, in looking even in the state contract, can we get one ordered? Can we get all the parts and pieces? Um, these are actually sitting on the ground in the state of Minnesota today. So, which is why we asked to um, put this on uh, as an agenda item <coughs> right away. So we can take advantage of the fact that this vendor uh, Rosedale Chevrolet actually has two of these units on their lot now. And so the $62,000 um, is for a, a 2,500 Chevrolet uh, um, a double cab and also the, includes the service body and uh, here's the keys. So um, I guess from a public works perspective, we work with the fleet committee, work with the water wastewater operators to, to figure out what the right answer is for us. And uh, we feel like a 4,000 pound would be more than adequate. So that'll be installed after after we get this vehicle here. So man, cause this was a budgeted item for 2023. That's what I didn't remember that. So it's kind of wondering. It was budgeted. You budget. said it was. It was, yes. that was yes. my question. Yes. Now, is that a diesel? <clears throat> no. Yes. 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 How much is the crane, John, or is that? Uh, there's a couple different options we're looking at, so I I, I would hate to give you a number right now. Um, mm -hmm. It depends on how many creature comforts you want. Um, so until we figure that out and what the right answer is, <laughs> I, I can't really tell you. So. Did you see the, the little yeah. click in there, but then he thought, no, I'm not yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 well, I got two numbers in there, and they're rattling around. <laughs> That's fine. I'll tell you one, so, okay. Retain a motion to approve. I'll make that motion. I'll second. Motion by Dave, second by Tim to approve the uh, purchase of the truck. Any other discussion? I have one other question. Oh, yeah, yeah. Are there any requirements for the operator, like crane licenses? Do we have to worry about any of that? I mean, we're talking 4,000 pound crane isn't a whole lot. No. Uh, are there any requirements for that we're going to need an additional training or anything like that? No, they're, they're general standard um, at that size. They're still general standard. Um, obviously, we would have to do the training on the, on the actual uh, capacities. 
and then the actual function of the of the crane itself sure and then the rigging um, that we would need most often what we do is we just have a clevis uh, with a hook and uh, most of the pump motors that we pick are obviously designed to be picked out of the uh, so it's just as simple as hooking a clevis up to a, a eye bolt typically so it, the training and the rigging is pretty easy to do so both of them are all computerized anyway, so they don't let you get in much trouble, do they? No, uh, no right. Yeah, if they if they sense overweight, they'll just typically they'll stop. Yeah, yeah just to reiterate uh, Matt's comment that it's a budget item. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. Larry, anything else, sir? Thank you. Call a motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. All right, eleven. Point six. We have a gambling license for the Hutchinson Hockey Association from January 13, 2023 through January 29, 2023. Yeah, they've got 22 on there, but it is 23. 23 so. Let me see if I have a party. Yeah, I changed it. <laughs> yeah, I would say it's. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so this is a regular gambling license and there's no concerns from staff. I'll make a motion to approve it. Second. Motion by Chad, second by Pat to approve. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carry. Uh, we have minutes, reports from committees and boards or commissions. We don't have any. Uh, staff update. Uh, Chief Kirkerson, you have anything else for us tonight? I don't. All right. Candace, you got anything else? John. I know. There's yeah. snow out there. There's a lot of snow. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of a recap. Uh, in 23 days, we had 37 inches of snow and we had operations on 20 out of those 23 days. Um, thankfully, we got Christmas Day off and we got New Year's Day off, which was very, very nice to have. Um, but I wanna, that's why the eyes don't quite line up with the holes. Um, but I do wanna just mention that because of the amount of snow that we had, we had to do things a little bit different. Um, and we also had some equipment failures. Um, that's gonna happen when you're moving that kind of material around and so I just appreciate everybody's patience with that and uh, we will be continuing to make improvements uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks here to uh, clear out some intersections to uh, clean some things up and haul some piles here and there. Um, toward that end we've opened up a couple of uh, additional snow uh, storage sites and then uh, we'll properly mark those for those that are uh, the publicly available lots. When that gets completely full, which is soon, uh, we'll, we'll have another site ready for um, private haulers to utilize, so. So John, just to you said we had 37 inches in 23 days? Yes. I, I just wanna add, um, first off, thanks to the staff for yeah. all that work. Um, but I also wanna note, I think sometimes the public forgets that that's not normal even in Minnesota to, and even in recent years to have that much snow. Cause I know we've had several calls from the public concerned about why trails haven't been cleared yet. And all I can say is that we're still working Correct. Yes. to do that. And so I, I think just maybe almost just a reminder for the public that that's a lot of snow. Yeah. And it's not that we're not trying to, it's just, it's taken us that long to, to clear it and so. That's five inches short of a typical winter's snow in less than uh, a month's time in roughly three weeks. Um, so uh, I understand there's a lot of snow <laughs> and it's frustrating and I get it. And you know, uh, it will take, certainly we'll be on it, like I said, for at least two more weeks before we get uh, things cleaned up to where we'd like to have them. So. And, you know, we've got priority to our priorities to get streets open. Right. Um, and so, like I said, I think it's just an important reminder for the, yeah. for the public as well. John, uh, so. you know, like maps and priorities. So how does it go? It goes streets first? 
right? No, what mayor actually? I can yeah. Bring that up. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yes. So our okay. first priority, and we have yeah. priority routes in the central business district. Right. Um, priority two is other business district truck routes in the airport. Three is through streets and specifically identified public properties. Fourth is cul-de-sacs, dead end streets and alleys. Fifth is um, sidewalks, trails, and walkways, and sixth is other public property and maintenance activities. So and seventh is my street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the mayor said we we say we don't. Call it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Priority seven A. Yeah. <laughs> but, it was, but no, I, it, yeah. a lot of snow. So yeah, I, I did run in uh, Donovan from the mm. Forest Street Department and. He was getting bait. He says, 11 days, I'm going fishing. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we had we did have one shot of 11 straight days. Yeah. And then we took Christmas Day off, and then we hit, hit it again. So, yeah. oh. um, so no, I think it, the, the guys did a wonderful job. And, Kudos and, to your, your whole staff. Yeah. And and they, they did wonderful for the amount of stuff. Public works yeah. and the parks, too. So. Yeah. Absolutely. It takes everybody. It takes all the private guys doing the private businesses, and that's worked well, and, and they're hauling still, and we are, too. So, all right, thanks. All right, yeah. thanks, John. Tim, let's start with you tonight. Gary always asks for a <laughs> so preparing every two weeks you're going to, and you don't have to. But. No, I'm glad you did. Uh, first of all, thank you to the council and to all the city staff for the welcome and for all the information and bringing you up to speed as quickly as they did, uh, and to the community for uh, the support of just making sure that uh, they've been supportive, and so I appreciate it. Well, welcome to yep. yeah, Welcome again. Dave. Well, the only thing is I'd go back to the snow removal is uh, I heard a lot of great things about the city uh, removing the snow, so a lot of kudos are coming out from the public, so you don't always hear all the bad things, so that's it. Yeah. I'm staying with the snow removal. <laughs> Remind people to uh, shovel their sidewalks in front of their places, because a lot of people aren't, and you're supposed to clear that. Um, we walk our dog, and... and you get whole blocks for people who's like, did you come out of your house at all in the last week? <laughs> it's, it's the handicapped people trying to get around with wheelchairs. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's a concern. Too. Evidently, Angie must have called you too. Huh? <laughs> I know she called the mayor and complained to him. But, um, <laughs> yeah. I guess, what is the Well, I mean, it, by ruling it's 24 hours after uh, snow stops falling, but <laughs> as we noted, you know, if I'm being honest, we're still clearing trails, you know, so it's yeah. not like the city is going to be out, you know, at this point ticketing, but it, it's a good reminder because I don't think it's, we don't have our own trails, it's tough for us to go on, but it's, I think it's just important that that's the, the assistance that you need from the public in, in times like this. So. Anything else, Matt? No. Great. Chad? Um, I just have one thing. Um, so, John, you know, like the other last week when there wasn't time to take all the snow out of downtown, just kind of push it out of the way for a little bit. Is there any way, somebody suggested this downtown, but um, maybe just mid block, just blast a little path so then people, if they park in the middle of the block, they don't have to walk all the way around the block. Maybe it's not possible. Because I know, like, they, they clean the sidewalk so people could walk, you know, but then. You know, there's a four foot drift to the street. Yeah, the, the hard part about that is the timing yeah. piece because the little guys are there before the big guys. Oh, and sure. So and that's if it's the not challenge. Possible, I just right. Thought I'd bring so it up. Our, our biggest concern is we don't plug the ends up. Yeah. You know, that yeah. that we can. But um, we'll, we'll, we'll play with that and see what we can come up with. Yeah, it's just if somebody parks in the middle of the block, then they have to walk yeah. all the way around. But mm -hmm. then that's a very unique situation. Right. We don't usually right. get that much snow stacked up. Right, it's pretty rare that we'd have as much as we did. Yeah. Um, you know, we just had, that was a foot of, foot plus of snow. Yeah, so. and the timing was just yeah. hard yeah. to get, get it all out. And generally, downtown's great, so. Yeah, yeah, so. That's all I had. All right, all right. thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jan. Man, um, I don't have a whole lot more. Just to note that city offices are closed on Monday for the holiday. So. All right. Um, I just have one thing. I, I uh, talked to Chief Schumann about it, and I kind of 
back to my fireman days, I guess. So, uh, believe it or not, an uh, active fire will grow twice in size every minute that it is active. So that's kind of why I kind of preach on cleaning out the fire hydrants. So um, just wanted to bring that, that up, that uh, if it's an active fire, it'll multiply every two minute it'll multiply by two so otherwise uh everybody be safe out there the there's going to be a little ice around so that's all i have motion to adjourn second motion by pat second by chad to adjourn all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed carry